So there is a book that was published in 1913 by a man named Stéphane Leduc. He published in the French language, and therefore the book has a French title, La Biologie Synthétique. And what he meant was constructing artificial life. Back in 1913, there was the chemistry tradition where people were isolating natural products from living systems, determining their molecular structures, and then synthesizing the molecules. And there was some degree of vision whereby Leduc understood that, well, in the future, people would try to synthesize uh, life. Now, one of the questions, of course, whenever you do synthesis is how much do you change what you already have? So every time you have a baby, you synthesize life. But of course, it's a natural synthesis. It's the baby is different from the parents, but not very different. And so one of the big questions in synthesis is to try to expand away from just natural animal husbandry. You have synthetic biology all the time. It's been going on for billions of years where you have the chemist intervene within the living system and try to make the life not entirely natural, but try to do something unnatural, make a new compound, make a new uh, species of molecule that still performs like life performs with a different molecular structure. So where we got into this field was trying to say, well, wait a minute, DNA, DNA, DNA has four nucleotides, G, A, C, and T. The genetic information is determined by the order of these four nucleotides. But if you draw the structures, the molecular structures of nucleic acids on a sheet of paper, you all of a sudden realize, well, there is more than just four that you could have. You could have six. You could have eight. You could have 10. You could even have 12 nucleotides that fit Watson Crick geometry and uh, should be able to form from 12 nucleotides, six base pairs and be replicated just like natural DNA is with four nucleotides and two base pairs. So synthetic biology then took on the meaning we make those. We create an artificial genetic system, not natural, or our design, but it still is able to do what natural genetics does, has children evolve, adapt to its environment, all the things that life does. And so synthetic biology took on that meaning as well. A third group of people then came in and basically called synthetic biology bioengineering. This goes back to the 1970s where recombinant DNA technologies, biotechnologies allows you to pick genes from here and pick genes from there, bring them together into one organism so you can design a new pathway to make a chemical or a natural product of some kind by combining enzymes from different sources that have different catalytic processes. So synthetic biology also came to mean um, the opposite of what I just described. For us, synthetic biology means um, using unnatural building blocks to do natural things like evolve and adapt. To the biotechnologist, synthetic biology means using natural things, natural pieces to do unnatural uh, outcomes like making a new chemical synthesis. So um, the, the United States government, for example, has many millions of dollars in DARPA now going to the second meaning of synthetic biology. And one of the promises has been that we would be able to standardize natural biological parts like Legos so that you could put them together without having to do too much work. They would be interchangeable parts. So that's synthetic biology's definition in its broadest example. And, and uh, two examples have been now the creation of artificial genetic systems. And the second is the rearrangement of natural genetic systems to create artificial products, artificial metabolites. So for example, today, if you want to you know, you drink vitamin C in your fruit drink, a lot of that vitamin C is manufactured by an enzymatic process that is in a sense synthetic biology. Citric acid also, many, many compounds are now made by natural fermentation in organisms that have been engineered using the second kind of synthetic biology. For new kinds of DNA, this has now been widely used in human diagnostics. For example, if you have HIV or hepatitis B, you will now go to the hospital and have the level of virus load measured using artificial genetic systems because they give you very clean, few false positives, very quantitative output because they are not interfered with by any of the natural DNA you have. Also, if you are worried about Ebola or, for example, noroviruses or enteroviruses, these are all RNA viruses. 
So synthetic biology here, meaning unnatural nucleic acid is being used so we can detect these viruses on an airplane, in an ambulance, in an apartment building, at points of sample. We don't have to send the sample away to a hospital or a clinic to determine what those are. So now you can ask the question, how do you design artificial genetic systems? And for this, you know, we go back to the structure of the Watson-Crick base pair. Watson and Crick recognize that DNA, A pairs with T, and G pairs with C in natural DNA, and that geometry, uh, the base pair comes from a geometry where a big purine, adenine, pairs with a small pyrimidine thymidine, a big guanine um, pairs with a small cytosine, but then you have hydrogen bond donors and acceptors on the bases, and, and with uh, the A, well, two hydrogen bond donors on the guanine, and say one hydrogen bond acceptor pairs with two hydrogen bond acceptors on the cytidine and one hydrogen bond donor on the cytidine, and it's this pairing of fingers <laughs> with fingers that uh, um, allows the base pairing to be specific in addition to big pairing with small. So what we have done to create extra letters in the genetic alphabet is just change the patterns of hydrogen bond donors and acceptors. We still have a big base, we still have a small base, big still pairs with small, but we have shuffled all the hydrogen bond donors and acceptors to allow the Watson-Crick pair to form with six letters or eight letters or 10 or 12 letters in the genetic alphabet, not just four. Of course, that involves a lot of organic chemical synthesis, which is a very big part of what we do in the laboratory. But we also have to develop the supporting molecular biology. Remember, it's very easy to synthesize GACT DNA because you have enzymes that, DNA polymerases, that will copy GACT polymerases and, uh, well, GACT DNA to give CGTA DNA as the copy. We have to develop polymerases that will not only copy G, A, C, and T, but also two extra letters like S and B, or two more extra letters like P and Z. And we have alphabets that have eight letters in them, and we have DNA polymerases that copy them. But then you need to develop more technology. How do you sequence DNA? Well, for G, A, C, T, sequencing DNA was done in the 1970s and 1980s, won Nobel Prizes for Fred Sanger and Wally Gilbert. We had to develop new technology to sequence not just GACT, but also GACT, ZP, SB, VX, and KJ, the 12-letter DNA. And that's a lot of chemistry. It's a lot of enzymology, a lot of molecular biology. Sure, so you might want to know how you can use these, right? So these are parts of toolkits. I've already mentioned diagnostics tools. These are very important for detecting nucleic acids in the environment. Um, very often you want to know, especially with infectious disease, whether a patient has Ebola, whether a mosquito is carrying yellow fever or dengue or some other virus. And so the very easy, very simple, uh, uh, and very clean ability of unnatural genetic systems to work in a world of natural DNA where there's no interference because they are unnatural and the natural DNA is different, allows you to detect infectious agents very easily in complex environments with very little background noise and very little mistakes. <laughs> it's very important when you're trying to detect infectious diseases like dengue in a mosquito or Ebola in a patient, you do not want to make mistakes. That's a bad idea. But the future, of course, is even bigger than this because right now almost all of synthetic biology takes place in test tubes. Putting these into bacteria, putting unnatural systems into bacteria is only a start. For example, when you have extra letters in the DNA alphabet, you can start writing extra words in the genetic code. This means that an E. coli bacteria not only need not have four nucleotides, it can have six, but it also is not any longer limited to 20 amino acids in its proteins. It can have 24 different amino acids. And so all of biotechnology can be based on your design, not what four billion years of biological evolution has provided. Because what you, I mean nothing personal, but your biochemistry is not perfect. You have 20 amino acids, but 
because you only have 20 amino acids, you must eat vitamins, for example. So much better it would be if you had 21 amino acids where the vitamin was incorporated into the amino acid and therefore was more, um, a, made a protein that had greater catalytic power. So the future is a quite, I mean, we don't believe that there's going to be any Frankenstein in your future. Obviously, these are still microorganisms, and of course, the microorganisms are very unnatural which means that they are not tasty. You don't eat them. You don't find, you, you know, well, they don't find you to be tasty either. They will not eat you, but they are very useful for manufacturing unusual compounds that can be used in manufacturing chemicals, foodstuffs, diagnostics, and medicines.